Thank you for the very kind introduction and also thank you um, to the organisers of um, the summer school for inviting me today. I can't believe the setting, it's absolutely amazing. So I feel extremely privileged to be here um, and I'm also staying till Sunday, which is great. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, the role of appetite regulation in obesity. And um, I'm actually going to start by giving you the context in which we in our lab have been studying the relationship between appetite control and obesity. Um, which is actually trying to understand the genetic basis of human body weight. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, briefly summarise the theory that we've been developing for the last sort of, 10 to 15 years in our lab, which we've called behavioural susceptibility theory. Talk about genetically sensitive designs and why we study them and how they're useful. And then I'm going to talk about some of the key studies that we've published over the last 10 years um, in our lab in this area. And then just a few thoughts about the implications of this research for policy. Um, so I just wanted to start by showing you this photograph of the body weights of identical twin children on the left and non-identical twin children on the right, just to show you how similar the identical twins are for their body weight compared to the non-identical twins. And this is an observation that's been made for decades and decades, actually probably since the turn of the century. And that's led researchers to propose that there's a strong genetic component to human body weight. And actually, there have probably been scores, if not hundreds, of twin studies now that have actually verified that there is a strong genetic basis to human body weight. And meta-analyses have, have found that it's in the order of sort of 50 to 90% of variation. So there's a very, very strong uh, genetic basis to obesity from family and twin studies. And the advent of human uh, genome-wide, sorry, genome-wide association studies that came along in the noughties started to identify some of the common genetic variants actually involved. And the first of these to be discovered, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, was the fat mass and obesity associate, associated gene called FTO. And if you are an adult of average height and you carry two copies of the high risk version for FTO, you're about three kilos heavier than an adult who carries two low risk versions of the gene. So it's not a huge effect size, but it's by far the largest of the effect sizes of all of the common variants that we have found. And um, since then, there have now been 97 common variants that are robustly associated with weight. So this was the last review published in Nature last year, which included um, upwards of 300,000 individuals. So um, we know that there's a strong genetic basis to body weight, and we're starting to identify some of the actual common variants that are involved. So the question is why or how? And Stephen O'Reilly very eloquently pointed out that there are three possible pathways, really, through which genes can influence weight. Either they're influencing partitioning of nutrients into fat, or they're influencing energy expenditure, or they're influencing energy intake. And it's really important, if we're going to try and understand the mechanisms through which genes are influencing weight, if we can understand the extent to which these different processes are under genetic control. And in our lab, for the last sort of 15 years, we've been developing um, an appetite model of obesity so-called behavioural susceptibility theory. And this hypothesises that obesity genes or weight genes are influencing weight, at least partly, through their effects on appetite here. And the two aspects of appetite that we've been studying in most detail are what we call satiety sensitivity, which I know some of you study as well, which is how easily you fill up once you start eating and how long you stay full for once you've eaten before you want to start eating again. And you might think of that as your eating offset switch. And the other side of appetite we study is what we call food responsiveness. And that's how avidly you respond to food cues in the environment when they're there. So that's wanting to eat or eat more when you see, smell, or taste very palatable food. And this model proposes that individuals who inherit a set of genes that confer greater food responsiveness and or lower satiety sensitivity those individuals are much more likely to overeat in response to the current food environment and to gain excessive weight. And so this model also helps to explain the seeming paradox of both genetic and environmental determination of weight, because weight can be both highly genetic and highly environmental at the same time. So an individual who inherits a set of genes that makes them very food responsive and low on satiety sensitivity is much more likely to overeat in the current environment than the, perhaps they were several years before. Um, and so we've been studying twins in our lab to try and understand the extent to which um, appetite is under genetic control and also to try and understand the extent to which they share what we call a common genetic pathway. 
And twins are the perfect design to do this because they're basically uh, the perfect natural experiment because identical twins are genetic clones of one another, so they are genetically 100% the same. But non-identical twins are on average 50% genetically the same. So they're actually exactly the same in terms of their genetic relatedness as any normal sibling. But the key difference is that like identical twins, they share their environments to a very, very similar extent. And so as researchers, we assume that the only real difference between the two types of twins is that the identical twins are twice as similar genetically. And that means that you can compare how similar identical twins are on any given trait of interest, such as body mass index, with how similar your non-identical twins are. And any difference between them, you assume, has to be only as a result of the identical twins being twice as similar genetically. And the statistic that you derive from twin modeling is called heritability, which I'm sure some of you have heard of before. And heritability is really an index of the genetic effect size and is the proportion of variation in a trait that's attributable to genetic variation. It doesn't tell you how important my genes are for influencing my weight. It tells us about variation, about individual differences. So it helps explain why I'm so short and someone over there is much taller than me. And this is how you do it. The basis of the method is to correlate your identical twins and you correlate your, your non-identical twins and you look to see if there's any difference in the resemblance between them. And this is just a, a very typical example of what you tend to see for human body weight. Um, and that's an identical twin correlation in blue and non-identical twin correlation in red. And you can see that the identical twins are correlated 0.75, the non-identical twins 0.45. That's a difference of 0.3. A quick and, way, quick and dirty way of estimating heritability is that you double the difference between it. So 0.3 times 2 is 0.6. So this pattern of correlations would indicate about 60% heritability in that trait. And we use maximum likelihood structural equation modeling to derive much more precise estimates of heritability, goodness of fit, um, and 95% confidence intervals. Um, we've also been studying appetite primarily in pediatric populations rather than adults, and there are several reasons for this. One is that children are much less likely than adults to deliberately change their eating behavior when being observed, especially in the context of a weight study, especially young children. Um, there's less dieting in children, which affects the relationship, obviously, between eating behavior and their weight. They haven't had long-standing long obesity, and infants and very young children can't have had, had long-standing obesity, which we know can itself cause aberrations in biology, which affect appetite. And if you can get get to observe them early enough, you can try and tease apart cause-effect relationships between appetite and weight. And this was the, uh, the very first twin study that we started to uh, look at appetite and weight in was the Twins Early Development Study, which is a very large population-based um, birth cohort of 16,000 pairs of twins born in England and Wales between 1994 and 1996. And Professor Jane Wardle um, charmed the PI of the study, Professor Robert Plowman, into allowing her to include some measures of anthropometrics, so height, weight, and waist circumference, um, and a measure of appetite when they were 10 years old. And this was the very first time that we were able to really look at the relationship between um, adiposity and appetite in a twin sample um, in children. TEDS also has DNA and genome-wide association data, which meant that there was also an opportunity to be able to look to see how appetite relates to identified common genetic variants. And so um, Jane developed something called the Child Eating Behaviour Questionnaire, which is a parent-reported psychometric measure of uh, a range of eight different um, eating behaviours in children that are hypothesised to be related to weight. And two of the scales measure food responsiveness and satiety responsiveness. And of course, the ideal situation would be to bring 5,000 pairs of twins into the lab and study them and get very precise measures. But of course, that isn't possible with a very large sample. And so... Uh, this psychometric measure was developed in order to really measure these traits on a very large population-based scale in the numbers needed to establish heritability estimates of reliable associations with weight. It has been validated using uh, behavioral measures in the lab. It's got very good internal reliability of all the different scales, good test-retest reliability, and the traits track pretty strongly from age 4 to 11 years. So this is a measure of these appetitive traits rather than states that you might find in, in one particular experiment. And so um, Jane, in 2008 with uh, Susan Connell, looked to see 
how these um, appetitive traits related to weight in the TED sample. And the most important thing that she did was she was interested to find out how these traits related to weight across the whole spectrum of weight. Because a very good theory of weight doesn't just explain why people are obese, it explains why one person is slightly bigger than another. So a good theory of weight should be able to explain a difference um, in BMI of, say, one unit. And so they divided the children into those in the lower normal or the lower healthy weight group, those in the uh, higher healthy weight group, the overweight group and the obese group. Um, and these are the results for satiety sensitivity. And on the top, this is for body mass index and on the bottom for waist circumference. And what they observed was that there seemed to be a, quite a linear relationship between weight and the appetitive characteristics. So it didn't seem to be the case that the obese children were doing something really odd and really weird that distinguished them for the rest, from the rest of the population. They were just a little bit less satiety sensitivity, uh, satiety sensitive than their peers. And you can see the relationship was actually that bit more uh, linear for a uh, waist circumference than for BMI. And this is the relationship between food responsiveness and BMI as well in the same 5,000 children. And again, you can see that um, the overweight and the obese children are not doing something completely different to everyone else because the lower normal weight children are less food responsive than the children in the higher normal weight. And there was a strong linear association with waist circumference. And just to make this point, Jane then um, added in a group of underweight children and a group of clinically obese children who were in uh, treatment at Great Ormond Street Hospital to look to see how their scores compared with the other um, weight categories. So you've got underweight on the left. So this is not working. Can you see? No, yeah. Underweight here on the left, healthy weight, overweight, obese, clinical. This was a subsample of the Twins Early Development Study um, aggregated with another um, community sample called Peaches. Um, and this is a clinical sample from the hospital. So here you saw um, a very, very linear, strong association between these appetitive characteristics and weight going right the way across the spectrum. So this indicated that um, children are slightly heavier because they are a little bit less satiety sensitive or a little bit more food responsive. Because they were twins, um, Susan and Jane were also able to establish the heritability of these traits by comparing how similar the identical twins were with how similar the non-identical twins were. And what I'm showing you here is the identical twin correlation in blue on the left for food responsiveness, and next to it, the non-identical twin correlation in red for food responsiveness. And on the right are the two twin correlations for satiety responsiveness. And I just want you to observe how different the two types of twins are in their similarity. So you can see here how much more similar the identical twins are for both food responsiveness and for satiety responsiveness. And this is indicating that there's a strong genetic contribution to both of these appetitive characteristics. And when we modeled the heritability of it, um, heritability was high. So um, the majority of variation in both of these appetitive characteristics was explained by genetic variation. So 75% of individual differences in how food responsive these children were, and 63% of individual differences in how satiety sensitive the children were, were explained by genetic variation. So this really supported the idea that genes are certainly um, underpinning appetite. So um, as I mentioned, the Twins Early Development Study also had um, genotyping data. And so um, as soon as the FTO gene was discovered in 2007. Professor Jane Wardle, pretty much overnight, um, called Robert Playman and said, do you have FTO? He said, yes. She said, can you send me the data? And she analyzed the association between satiety sensitivity and FTO pretty much that night. And what she found was that, whoops, children um, who carry two copies of the high-risk version, the AA children, was significantly less satiety sensitivity, si significantly less satiety sensitive than the other children. And the important observation that they made was that actually this relationship remained even after adjustment for the child's BMI. So this indicated that FTO was influencing satiety sensitivity independently of their, uh, their body size. So this supported, again, the idea that um, obesity genes could be influencing weight, at least partly through their effects on appetite. Um, and this is data showing how 
a genetic risk score that included 30 different variants, but not FTO, related to both weight and satiety sensitivity. So um, once, the, once a few more of these genetic variants started to be published, we were able to create what's called a genetic risk score for obesity. And that's simply where you look to see how many of these genetic um, obesity risk increasing variants that someone carries and you add them up and you create a score for each individual and you look to see if their genetic risk score is associated with their weight or with anything else. And the graph on the left just shows you here, this is a histogram of genetic risk score. So in the twins early development study, like you see in the population at large, genetic risk of obesity is completely normally distributed. So most people have a, a, a medium amount of risk and a few, uh, a few children at the high end and a few children are at the low end. And as you go up the genetic risk of obesity, uh, so BMI increases and waist circumference increases as well. And that's exactly what we would expect to see. But this graph over here shows the association between satiety responsiveness and genetic risk of obesity. And you can see that the relationship goes in the other direction. So as you go up genetic risk of obesity, satiety sensitivity goes down. So children at the highest end of genetic risk of obesity are the children who are least, who are least sensitive to satiety. And we were able to show that satiety sensitivity significantly mediated the relationship between genetic risk and adiposity. So these findings seem to indicate that even when you take FTO out of the equation and you're looking at the other genes involved, they are still associated with appetite. And so the observation that um, appetite has a very strong genetic basis by the time children are 10 years old and that the relationship between appetite and weight is all already very, very well established um, led Jane to decide that actually if we want to understand how appetite and weight are related, we're probably going to have to go back really, really, really early. The other thing is that, of course, the cross-sectional data shows exactly what we want it to show, but you can't know anything about causality from cross-sectional data, and Annika's smiling at me over there because that's a conversation that we have all the time. Um, and so Jane decided to um, establish Gemini, and Gemini is a prospective birth cohort and so um, what she wanted to do was to be able to, to measure appetite from as early as it's possible to measure it in uh, postnatal life and to get really, really, really detailed growth data from birth going forward and to keep measuring appetite and to look to see when the relationship between appetite and weight emerges and how genes and the environment are contributing to this, to, uh, this relationship as it develops. And Gemini includes uh, 2,402 families who had twin births between March and December 2007. It's actually the largest twin study ever set up specifically to look at genetic and environmental contributions to early growth. And we've been collecting weight data every three months, and they're now eight turning nine. So we've got incredibly detailed growth data. And in the first year of life, we asked the parents to send in all of the growth measurements that are taken routinely by health professionals um, in a particular book that everyone's given to photocopy it and to send them in so that we could record them and model the data. We measured appetite at three months and then again at 16 months. And when they were 21 months old, we sent three day diet diaries to um, all of the families and, and asked the mothers to record every single thing that every child ate and drank, where they were, what time it was, um, etc. And that's actually now the largest dietary data set for toddlers in the UK. So this is just an example of um, questions from the baby eating behavior questionnaire. So the first task that we had was to um, develop an infant measure of uh, satiety responsiveness and food responsiveness, which was no easy task. And so we developed the BEBQ and um, we gave it to all of the families in Gemini. And we specifically asked the mothers to report on the infant's appetite during the milk feeding phase before any solid food had been introduced. So this is the very first few weeks of life when um, appetite starts to emerge. And this is just to show you, these are histograms of satiety responsiveness and food responsiveness in Gemini, just to show you that there's actually considerable variation, even in this early period of feeding um, in appetite. So in order to study how appetite related to growth really, really early on, we used the twin design in slightly different ways. So we identified twin pairs who are discordant for food responsiveness and satiety responsiveness by at least one standard deviation in the measure. And we had 228 pairs. 
And then we were able to track their growth trajectories from birth to 16 months of age. And we had uh, over two, two and a half thousand uh, weight observations. And what we found was that the twin who was, significant, who was lower on satiety sensitivity grew significantly faster than his or her, her co-twin over 50 months of age. And so the line in blue is the twin who was lower in satiety sensitivity and the bottom line is the co-twin. And by 15 months of age, there was about a kilo's difference in weight, which doesn't sound like a lot to you and I, but at that age, it's about 10% of body weight. So that's equivalent to being 60 or 66 kilos. And if you're a woman of average height, say one meter 60, that's a difference of two and a half BMI units. So it's actually a considerable difference. Um, this is just to show you that we found exactly the same relationship for food responsiveness. So the more food responsive co-twin is the line on the top and the less food responsive co-twin on the bottom. And of course, because they're twins, we then wanted to find out um, if these appetitive characteristics had a genetic basis, and indeed they did. So again, you can see there's a big difference between the size of the correlations between the two types of twins, indicating a genetic contribution. And heritability was high, particularly high for satiety sensitivity. So 72% of that trait, of the variation in that trait, was being explained by genetic variation, even in the first few weeks of life before any solid food has been introduced. And so what we actually saw was that the heritability of these traits in infancy is, is pretty similar to um, what we observe in, at 10 years old. So the genetic effects are there pretty early on. Um, because these traits are obviously so important for weight, um, we wanted to unpick them a bit to try and understand how these particular um, appetitive characteristics play out in terms of everyday eating behavior. And we were able to do this using our diet diaries. So we also measured um, these two traits, food responsiveness and satiety responsiveness, using the CBQ when they were 60 months old. And we had the three-day diet diaries completed for 3,300 uh, children when they were 21 months old. And so what we did was we separated out our behaviors into um, the average meal size throughout the day and the average meal frequency. And what we hypothesized was that there's two ways that you can eat too much or overconsume in a day. One is you're eating a bit too much every time you eat. And the other is that you're eating too often throughout the day. And um, we looked at these in relation to food responsiveness and satiety sensitivity, hypothesizing that if you're, if you're low on satiety sensitivity, perhaps you might eat a little bit too much every time you eat. If you're food responsive, perhaps you might be responding in the to food cues in the environment and perhaps eat a little bit more often. And what we found was that uh, the two traits actually are characterized by quite different um, eating behaviors. So, these are the unstandardized coefficients for satiety responsiveness, food responsiveness, and average meal size. And what we found was food responsiveness is not related to how much you eat on average every time you eat. But children um, who are less satiety sensitive consume more calories. So um, these are unstandardized coefficients. So a one unit increase on the satiety sensitivity score is associated with eating 10 fewer calories. And this is a five point scale, so we can unpack this a bit. And what that means is that a child scoring lowest and a child scoring highest are consuming 37 calories different every time they eat. But they eat five times a day, so the difference is about 185 calories a day, which adds up to over two, uh, 1,200 calories a week or 5,627 extra calories a month. So you can see how these tiny effects aggregate over time. Um, satiety responsiveness wasn't associated with eating frequency. So that had no, uh, no relationship at all. But food responsiveness, as we suspected, was. So um, a one unit increase in the scale was associated with eating 0.1 times more per day. So again, looking at the difference between children scoring the lowest and the highest, the children who were scoring the highest are consuming three extra meals uh, per week. And this equates to about um, 540 calories. So, Lastly, we were just interested to see how these um, eating behaviors actually relate to weight and to weight gain. Um, and what we found was that, interestingly, meal frequency isn't associated with weight when they are 21 months, two years old, um, as you can see here. So all the children, whether you're normal weight or overweight, you eat about five times a day. 
but meal size was significantly associated with weight. So overweight children were consuming um, about 12 calories more every time they eat. And again, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 60 calories a day, 420 calories a week, and about 1,800 calories a month. And importantly, we used our prospective data to look to see how these related to uh, growth. And for every 10 calorie increase at each meal, there was a 4% increase in growth rate relative to the average um, from two years to five years. So you can see that these probably add up and, and are important in weight gain over time. And just very briefly, we replicated our findings exactly um, in the Diet and Nutrition Survey of Infants and Young Children um, very briefly. And this was presented at EASO last week, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, what are the implications of this? Well, um, variation in appetite does appear to have a very strong genetic basis and it's important in driving early weight gain. Um, and it looks like appetite is driving um, increases in weight, not the other way around. And there are behavioral expressions of these appetite characteristics. And if you are low on satiety sensitivity, you're just eating a little bit too much every time you eat. If you're a food responsive child, you're eating a little bit more often. Um, and infants and toddlers who are demonstrating these aptitude traits, they may actually be poorer at self-regulating, contrary to what people believe about young children and toddlers. Um, these behaviours might offer targets for intervention, but we don't know. Um, I guess we need to find out if we can actually change these. And I think an important point is that the differences actually in size and frequency are really, really small. They're almost... Um, undetectable to the human eye. So that makes it very difficult um, in talking about advice for, par for parents. Just want to recognise the funders of the study, all the collaborators and mentors who contributed to the work. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, I want to recognise Professor Jane Wardle, who I'm sure many of you know died last year in October, a few days before her 65th birthday. She was um, an outstanding behavioural scientist. She was the brains behind behavioural susceptibility theory. Um, ran the lab for many years and was my mentor for 10 years. So, any, any questions? Thanks for showing these interesting data. I've, one general question. Um, to what extent might the data that you've shown be uh, confounded by either parental behavior and also uh, meal quality rather than um, quantity? So, by parental behavior, do you mean modeling? Um, what I actually mean is um, when you talk about food responsiveness and young children obviously don't take the food from the cupboard themselves, yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's how parents so, deal with that. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So I was wondering if one of the reasons why food responsiveness isn't associated with weight at that age, but satiety responsiveness is, is because a child doesn't have any control over how many times they eat in the day. But um, in the diaries, we asked the parents to record how much was eaten, not how much was offered. And so um, we're trying to get an idea of how much a child is responding to the offering. And so they have m arguably more control over how much they consume each time they eat um, relative to food frequency, definitely, yeah.